Uh, good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming uh, and listening to the talk today. Um, I'm really grateful to be able to share with you today some of the things uh, my team and the open source community have been doing uh, and working on around Cloud Foundry, monitoring Cloud Foundry. Uh, I'm Jeff Barrows, and I'd like to answer a question that you may have, um, and you may have right on the top of your mind right now as you look at this image. Um, no, that is definitely not me up on top of that windmill. Uh, this is somebody who's crazy and does um, some pretty extreme stuff on maintenance on these machines. Uh, I am a uh, engineering manager and technical lead uh, for the cloud services team at GE Digital, and uh, I work uh, much more comfortably on distributed compute systems like Cloud Foundry. Uh, my team, the cloud services team, is responsible for building and running uh, the Cloud Foundry ecosystem for a GE service called Predix. Uh, and Predix is a cloud platform. Uh, it allows developers to build and run applications that can interface with some of the things that GE produces, like uh, jet engines. Uh, again, that guy is not me. Uh, he's standing in a test facility with one of uh, GE's latest uh, jet engines. Uh, our aviation division makes state-of-the-art jet engines that are used on many of the commercial jets flown today. And in fact, uh, every two seconds, an aircraft powered by GE jet engines is taking off somewhere in the world today. And uh, at any given moment, like right now, there's 2,200 aircrafts in the air uh, carrying over 300,000 people. So it's kind of crazy to think that there's actually 300,000 people above the Earth at any given moment in time. Um, but GE is powering some of those, uh, those, jet, those jet planes. Uh, our trans uh, transportation division makes locomotives. Uh, brand new state-of-the-art GE locomotive uh, features hundreds of sensors and generates hundreds of thousands of data points a minute. And by connecting these rolling sensors to uh, Predix, uh, it can help us develop apps that help unlock new efficiencies in rail transportation systems. So it's estimated that um, every 1% increase in rail uh, efficiency uh, in the US today is worth about $1.8 billion. We also make many of the machines that make up oil and gas production facilities, things like uh, industrial compressors, generators, uh, pumps, all the things that are critical to the safe extraction and production of oil and gas around the globe. Uh, efficiencies in these systems gathered through insights uh, created by software help extend running periods of these machines, uh, minimize production disruption, and re help reduce costs. Our power and water uh, division makes these massive uh, gas turbines that generate electricity. And this one alone uh, generates enough electricity to supply half a million homes with, with power. Uh, GE equipment generates half of the world's installed power base. And 80% uh, of the electricity flowing in North America is controlled by uh, GE systems. Uh, and you guessed it, those four guys working on that turbine are definitely not me. This is not my brain. Um, <laughs> but uh, GE Healthcare makes some of the most advanced uh, imaging systems in the world. And by connecting these MRI machines to GE Health Cloud, which runs on top of Predix, uh, we can provide better, faster diagnostics and provide uh, actionable information to patients more quickly, which directly impacts their lives and their quality of care. So. Um, by connecting, as you can uh, kind of get the point, uh, by connecting a lot of these industrial machines to the Predix platform, we're basically enabling brand new efficiencies and opportunities that only a connected software platform can unlock. It's uh, really, truly an exciting time to be working here at GE Digital. So if you have any uh, questions about it, please feel free to ask me about it. Um, the reason I'm really talking about Predix today is because it's uh, mainly built on a number of components. Uh, the GE Digital uh, software engineers build a whole bunch of industrial uh, microservices that can be composed and used to build these um, pretty awesome uh, industrial applications. But Predix is also built on top of Cloud Foundry. Um, as you're probably aware, uh, Cloud Foundry makes it really easy for app developers to quickly deliver production grade applications to market. Uh, over the past 16 months or so, our team, uh, the cloud services team, has built a global Cloud Foundry deployment footprint. Uh, we've enabled thousands of developers to start writing industrial applications, and we're currently running tens of thousands of application instances across the globe today. So it's been quite a journey. Um, but we didn't just get here magically overnight, so how did we get here? 
It all started pretty simply, and um, it probably started in a way that um, it started for many of you starting to run Cloud Foundry today. Uh, it started with a POC. Um, we began with a, green, a Greenfield uh, empty AWS VPC account and some credentials, and um, we were really fortunate enough to be able to work with Dr. Nick uh, and the Stark and Wayne folks, and in a few months had a full-blown dev environment up and running in our Amazon environment. Uh, with the help of a handful of app devs at uh, Digital, we showed that we could get a brilliant factories application, an MVP, up and running really quickly. Um, so uh, after proving the point that um, Cloud Foundry was indeed helping developers go really fast, um, we got a challenge from leadership to say, hey, listen, can you actually deliver four production applications to a paying customer in less than three months? And we were like, oh man, it's, that's, it's getting serious. Uh, so it's game on, it's time to productionalize Cloud Foundry. So um, <clears throat> being the operationally inclined kind of guy that I am, I thought, well, first things first, uh, let's get some monitoring and telemetry on the system. Let's see if we can get some kind of metrics out of this black box that's called uh, Cloud Foundry. So uh, being new to Cloud Foundry, it was time to start digging into that black box to really um, start figuring out how things worked. Um, but have you, really, uh, have you actually looked at all the things that comprise Cloud Foundry? And you're like, holy crap, that's not a moon. It's Cloud Foundry. And you realize like, it's, com it's composed of um, 12 different subsystems that <clears throat> really make up the underpinnings of of Cloud Foundry, cloud controllers, NAT servers, Go routers, uh, runners, logger gators, databases, and Bosch. So you're like, such wow, this is gonna be a crazy uh, adventure. This is gonna be a really challenging um, thing to kind of get our hands on. So where do we start? Um, we started pretty simply with uh, CloudWatch. So we were deploying in AWS. We had CloudWatch stats for free. Um, we kind of took a peek uh, at CloudWatch and we were like, all right, great, we can kind of see all the different components that make up Cloud Foundry now. We have the general uh, feel for um, you know, the, the Linux uh, stats that are coming off of it. But we quickly realized that uh, CloudWatch wasn't gonna be our long-term solution. Um, we had a number of reasons. We wanted to have a unified monitoring approach across both uh, AWS and data center deployments. Um, we wanted something that had a little bit better uh, uh, flexible uh, metrics collection and rendering service. So um, we pretty quickly moved, moved away from CloudWatch. So uh, time to build. So uh, engineer inside me says, awesome, this is gonna be so much fun. It's gonna be a great project. I get to learn all the cool new uh, monitoring solutions out, that are out there today. And then uh, the engineering manager inside of me says, no, it's gonna be, this has like a potential to be a black hole. We may not be able to make something that's actually gonna work. Um, I'm really nervous about kind of event, uh, approaching this adventure. So um, what do we do? So first we started uh, detailing some high level uh, goals for our metrics and, and monitoring collection system. Uh, the system we believed it should be a, like a utility service. So it should be highly available, it should be ubiquitous, uh, it should be everywhere, and it should be as easy uh, for anyone to use as turning on a light switch. Um, coverage should be automatic. Uh, the system should be born with monitoring coverage. It should be able to be driven by uh, configuration management systems. And then when the system retires or dies for whatever reason, it should automatically be removed from coverage. Uh, it should be an extensible system. So as we get good at the basics, uh, we should, be really, uh, should easily be able to add increasingly sophisticated capabilities to the system. We knew uh, you know, how to monitor Linux systems really well and get the, the base statistics out of that, but Cloud Foundry was a little bit more abstract. We didn't know exactly um, how we were gonna interface with the system and how we were gonna pull data that could help uh, show the health and well-being of that system. Uh, lastly, it should integrate really well with our existing configuration management tools. So uh, we use Bosch naturally for uh, all of our Cloud Foundry deployments. Uh, we use it for some services deployments, and then we use Chef quite a bit for service deployments and some supporting systems as well. So uh, we took a look at the current state of monitoring back in 2014, and uh, after a quick bake-off, uh, we decided to build an MVP solution using Sensu uh, as a monitoring framework, Graphite as a metrics collection system, and Grafana for data visualization. 
So um, let's talk a little bit about sensu. Uh, what is sensu? So aside from being the Japanese word for a folding fan, you can kind of see where the logo is inspired, uh, it's a composable framework. And with it, you can do things like execute service checks, uh, you can send notifications and alerts, you can collect metrics, and then you can drive uh, all the setup and configuration using configuration management tools. So it checks all the boxes for the things that we wanted to do. Uh, let's give a quick overview of the Sensu architecture. Uh, it's comprised of a couple different layers. Uh, the first one is the Sensu server layer. It's an N-tier uh, stateless system. You can deploy as many uh, Sensu servers as you want. Uh, the Sensu server is responsible for publishing the check requests and then processing events as they come back. Uh, there's a RabbitMQ cluster. Uh, we have a, a multi-node RabbitMQ cluster, so it can be uh, fault tolerant. We distribute and replicate queues, uh, so it's fault tolerant to node failure and availability zone failure. And then uh, the Sensu clients. There are a Ruby client that gets distributed out to uh, all of the, the uh, machines that we want to have um, coverage on. They execute checks and uh, uh, posts back um, uh, data back to, to Sensu for processing. Uh, and then there's a Redis cluster. Uh, the Redis cluster basically keeps track of a couple things, but mainly uh, health check state. So then you can do things like uh, occurrence-based checks. So you can say, hey, if my CPU has been over um, threshold for the last three checks, then go wake somebody up. Uh, and then lastly, the uh, Sensu API server. So this is basically the thing, uh, REST APIs that can interface with the Sensu subsystems. It's what all of the different uh, Sensu admin dashboards are based on. So those, those guys can talk to Sensu APIs to pull a list of clients, pull, pull lists of checks, uh, get check data. Um, it can also be used to integrate with third party systems as well, which is pretty cool. So uh, let's walk through uh, how we actually execute a service check using Sensu. So uh, first, the Sensu server publishes a check request to uh, subscriber queues on RabbitMQ. Uh, the Sensu clients that are configured to uh, subscribe to that particular queue see the message that gets published to the, uh, the queue, takes it off, uh, executes the, the check, and then uh, publishes a response back to RabbitMQ. The Sensu servers uh, process that check response, and as I mentioned before, we can have scale that tier out for scalability and resiliency. Uh, Sensu server uh, processes that event and triggers uh, actions if they're so configured, and then updates Redis with uh, the health check state. We'll take a quick look at what a service check actually looks like. So this is uh, the service anatomy of a service check. It's basically, it's really simple. Um, it's a command or script uh, which runs and outputs data to standard out or standard error. So if you're familiar with um, Nagios health checks or Nagios plugins, it follows the same standard. If you have a fleet of uh, Nagios scripts that you've collected and built over time, uh, you can drop those in to Sensu and run those right away, so it's all supported right out of the box. Um, basically, the, the commander script will run and then produce an exit code. Zero is okay, one is warning, two is critical, and three is custom. So we use an exit code of three for, uh, to indicate that we have a metrics uh, type response for the, for the check. Uh, and then it can also put an optional um, uh, response payload, usually in JSON, onto the message bus uh, attached with that particular response. Uh, you define a list of subscribers. So this is a list of the nodes that should be interested in running that particular health check. Uh, and then there's handlers. Handlers are things that uh, take action on events if any are configured. And lastly, uh, there's a check interval, so you can specify how often you want the check to run. So this is a quick uh, overview of what an actual check definition looks like. It's simple JSON. Uh, you can see it's got the uh, check name, uh, which is check disk usage. It's got a couple of flags in there for uh, warning and critical thresholds. Uh, it's got the subscriber defined as production DEA. So this would run on all of our production runner nodes. Uh, handler is configured to pager duty. So if this goes bump in the night, it's gonna go and wake somebody up. And it runs every 60 seconds. 
So handlers, I mentioned handlers a couple times. This is, it's really hard to overstate the power and flexibility of the, the handler construct within Sensu. Uh, handlers are basically actions executed by a Sensu server when events are received. Uh, things like send a note to PagerDuty, uh, send a metric to Graphite, integrate with Flowdoc, or maybe send an email. Uh, there are four primary uh, handler primitives. Uh, there's a pipe uh, handler type, which is uh, external command that get, gets run. Uh, it can consume that uh, JSON payload that gets put on the, on the event response onto the message bus. You can parse it. It's any language that you want. It can be Bash. It can be Ruby. It can be whatever that you're most uh, comfortable with. Process that data, transforms it, and then does something with it. So send an email, integrate with Flowdoc, or what have you. Um, Second type is the TCP UDP handler type. So it knows how to make a network socket connection to an external system. Uh, this is how we get uh, stats shoved over to our graphite system today. Uh, so it's a pretty powerful uh, construct. Uh, the last main one is the, the transport handler type. So if you wanted to, you could have a second named, another named queue on RabbitMQ. You could publish a message to, to that queue and then have third party or external resources actually watch that queue and that pub sub model and then pull events off for like extra third party integrations. Um, the last one is really a, a concatenation of all of these. So you can, if you wanted to take multiple actions on an event at any time, uh, you could say, I want to send the stat over to Graphite and then I want to page somebody and wake them up and uh, maybe put a message on a message bus for, for a third party system. So uh, metrics and, and uh, gra uh, metrics collection using Graphite and Grafana. Uh, Graphite is an open source system uh, that allows us to collect, store, and render time series data. It's got a uh, simple line protocol uh, that basically consists of the metric name, uh, the timestamp in epic format, and the metric value. You just can actually netcat that out to a socket and get a, a metric uh, persisted in, in Graphite. Uh, and then it's got flexible storage backends. It supports Whisper, DB, flat files. That's what we use today uh, to scale out. We're handling hundreds of thousands of metrics a second using Whisper DB. Uh, we know that there's a, a, probably a runway that we're not going to be able to support uh, much, uh, a lot more unless we really scale that out. So it also supports InfluxDB, OpenTSDB, Cyanite, and others. Uh, and then it's got a really super robust uh, API for metrics retrieval uh, and analytics functions. So you can basically execute a curl command, get data back out of Graphite, and you can get it to do some things like averaging or percentiles or sums and things like that, which is pretty cool. So uh, we'll walk through how Sensu uh, gets metrics into Graphite real quick. Um, as we remember before, uh, the, uh, metrics check is scheduled. Uh, the clients run that check and then publish the event back to the message bus. The Sensu servers are configured with a Graphite handler, which knows how to make that, excuse me, the uh, TCP connection to, to Graphite, processes the uh, metrics event request, and then connects uh, directly to what's called Carbon Relay. It's a Python process. Uh, it's basically responsible for metrics ingestion and routing. Uh, it knows how to get that metric off the wire and then into a persistence layer. So uh, there's a number of different cool things it can do to help support distribution of uh, storage using consistent hashing and replicas. Uh, in this case, it uh, uses consistent hashing to send that metric out to the carbon cache and whisper DB layer. So it sends that metric out to three nodes that are split across multiple availability zones to support um, that level of fault tolerance. Um, and then it's written to the whisper DB flat file. So now your metric is off the wire and on the disk. Um, we want to be able to look at those things, because what good is it if it's just stored on a disk? So we use Grafana. Uh, Grafana is a really awesome uh, web interface that lets you build these really cool um, uh, uh, dashboards and, and KPIs. Uh, it knows how to talk to the Graphite API, and Graphite API knows how to pull metrics um, from the disk and then um, pu push it back into the dashboard for visualization. Lastly, uh, we also uh, have a Sensu client, uh, Graphite Metrics Health Check, that is able to execute similar requests against the Graphite API 
uh, to be able to pull metrics out and then to be able to do some thresholding and, uh, and alerting off of those. So great, um, but what we have now is a monitoring system and a metrics collection system. We can execute health checks, we can execute metrics retrieval checks, we can get that data shoved into a data time series uh, database. Uh, how does that help us monitor Cloud Foundry? Uh, so we, one of our original goals was that we'd have um, automatic coverage of all of the things. So uh, what we did was create a Bosch release of the Sensu client. Uh, so we bundled up all the uh, Sensu client bits, the Ruby parts of it, and then all of the health checks that have to get executed uh, across, across the fleet. And um, we cr uh, included that Sensu client job in all of our Bosch deployments. So anything that Bosch deploys, whether it's Cloud Foundry or any of the, the tiles or things that we use uh, Bosch to deploy, we also include the uh, Sensu client job. So now uh, every node uh, uh, that gets deployed and pushed out using Bosch has coverage. We configure it to belong to the all group. It's just a default, it's just a word. We could have called it digital, we could have called it whatever. But uh, now it basically it allows us to capture all uh, base Linux statistics for all the nodes that, uh, that Bosch is pushing out, which is pretty cool. Uh, we ca capture things like CPU utilization, network uh, utilization, memory, and, and disk, and, and the such. A uh, quick note on metric names. Uh, this probably uh, can't be understated as well. Uh, setting a naming standard for metrics is one of the most important things you can do as you plan uh, your graphite deployment. Uh, if you do it in a, in a rationalized way, it will enable you to do things like uh, wildcard aggregation of statistics, which is uh, super nice to be able to do in a Cloud Foundry uh, distributed systems world. Uh, it minimizes uh, uh, maintenance of our dashboards and KPIs, so things are kind of self-maintaining as we scale out uh, subsystems of Cloud Foundry. So this is kind of an anatomy of a name uh, for our metrics. Uh, we base our names on uh, the Bosch deployment. So you can see here, uh, the first part is the, uh, this is a Bosch deployment for our US West production Cloud Foundry deployment. Uh, the second component of that is the actual Bosch job name. So if you're familiar with looking at Bosch manifests, I'm sorry, but uh, you'll probably be familiar with seeing the, the different sub components that are uh, comprising that, that deployment. This is runner Z1, so um, this is a, a runner job that is for availability zone one. And then this is the instance number or the index uh, of that job. So if you want to, if your, your deployment has 10 uh, runners within availability zone one. This will go through zero through nine. And then the last part of it is the actual metric name. And this is generated more by the metrics check uh, that you schedule to run. So this one in particular will grab uh, E0 transmit bytes uh, statistics. So uh, this is a, a dashboard that uh, I was gonna walk through real quick uh, showing like how we actually com construct a dashboard, but uh, this is a basic example of what you can capture uh, just uh, by getting uh, the base Linux statistics. And um, some of the cool things, it's, I don't know if it's really easy to see here, but um, what we've done is basically for each of the uh, Cloud Foundry subcomponents, we've created a high level KPI uh, that captures these Linux statistics. And um, using wildcard aggregation uh, with our metrics definitions, we can actually get uh, like CPU utilization or memory utilization across the entire fleet of say uh, the runner pool. Uh, and then we can do things like uh, do some percentiles and things like that. So we can kind of see where the outliers are and where the common, uh, uh, where the common uh, things are. So we can kind of drill into those if we need to. Um, it's really easy to basically rinse and repeat, so you kind of define your standard ones uh, for, for one set, and then you can just go through and change the names, generate uh, quick dashboards for all of the others, um, which is great. But uh, it still doesn't really give us a lot of depth into uh, the Cloud Foundry subsystems, right? So now we can monitor all this stuff, uh, like Linux is spitting out, uh, CPU, memory, network, and disk for all that stuff, gets us a little bit further than what we had with uh, CloudWatch because we have a nice uh, environment to be able to generate dashboards and, 
uh, explore that data a little bit more flexibly. But um, now we really need to start peering into uh, the health and well-being of the Cloud Foundry subsystems. So um, after a bit of research, we came across a few open source tools that uh, helped us crack that case. And uh, the first one uh, we use is uh, the collector. So it's a Ruby program, it's an open source project. Uh, it basically listens on the NATS bus for CF subsystem announcements. Uh, it pulls their, uh, their subsystems varz and helz endpoints, and then it knows how to uh, get that data and parse it out and then push it um, directly to the carbon demons for the graphite system uh, to persist to disk. Uh, unfortunately, that's being phased out, and it's being phased out pretty rapidly. Uh, I think I just heard uh, as of 236, Cloud Foundry release, the, they're not, a lot of the subsystems are no longer supporting that uh, varz helz endpoint, which kind of sucks. Uh, but there's hope, uh, so they're changing the model and they're starting to publish statistics to Loggergator, uh, and then you can actually make some nozzles that attach to the logging subsystem so you can start parsing that out. So we're, uh, we're actively working on, um, obviously moving to that direction so we can continue to get all the stats that we need from Cloud Foundry. But, uh, Collector gives you a ton of di different data. So um, this is a sample dashboard that we created. It's based on a lot of the good work that the PWS guys have done, uh, a lot of documentation up on the, the Cloud Foundry website about um, monitoring Cloud Foundry. I uh, followed those uh, outlines pretty detailed and then uh, built this kind of stoplight type dashboard. It gives a really high level overview of uh, all the different subsystems in, in Cloud Foundry. Uh, things like uh, total number of runners, the expected number of cloud controllers, UAA servers, uh, total DA memory used, uh, routes. Um, this one's inter the, the yellow one is pretty interesting. And it's the available memory ratio it helps us know when we need to scale out and add more capacity to the runner layer. Um, we could spend tons of time just talking about this one. Um, this is kind of like a high level one. It's a, it, this dashboard's up in our, like, in our knock area so people can kind of look at it and get a general sense of like, hey, is, things, are, is everything pretty green? Yep, everything's pretty green. But uh, if you need to, you can continue to drill into and uh, make specialized dashboards for, even, uh, for each Cloud Foundry subcomponent. So this one shows uh, some detailed uh, router stats. So it shows things like total routes, uh, it shows HTTP response codes from both your, um, your DEAs, the applications that are running, as well as uh, response codes that come off of like kind of the core Cloud Foundry components, like your cloud controllers. If you see a lot of 500s coming off cloud controller, maybe there's something wrong with cloud controller. Uh, it also shows like CPU aggregation and, and some other things uh, that might be of interest. Total network, that's uh, like throughput that's coming across your whole Go router fleet. You can do aggregations like that, which is pretty cool. Uh, and yep, that's sweet dashboard, but um, I'm not watching that dashboard all the time, 24 by seven, so how do we actually get um, actions and take actions out of that thing? Um, and that's where we developed the uh, Sensu uh, HTTP health check that can query the Graphite API. So uh, we schedule uh, the HTTP health check on a couple different uh, Sensu clients. It knows how to construct basically a curl statement. So you can actually go in and those dashboards that you created, you can pull the, the, the definition out of that and put it into a curl statement, uh, fire it off against the Graphite API. Graphite can go and retrieve the metrics, do the uh, type of aggregation that you're thinking of doing. You can get an individual data point or a set of data points, or you can average or sum, uh, and then respond, uh, give, give a response back to the Sensu client. Uh, with a, a, a JSON payload that has the details. And um, then Sensu can actually take uh, action on that. So you can define thresholds and, and do all the good things that you can do with handlers and to wake somebody up with PagerDuty. And, and that's about it. So I'm sorry, I only had a, a few minutes to, to give you a high level overview about this, but uh, hopefully it gives you a better idea about uh, how we're using Sensu and Graphite as the backbone of our monitoring solution. Um, we're working on getting the Bosch release of uh, Sensu Client up on our, on our GitHub, so it should be publicly available. Uh, hopefully that'll help give you a head start and you can um, get, get working with that. I know uh, Stark and Wayne guys have helped put out a Bosch release of Sensu Server in the ecosystem, so that's out there. 
And um, yeah, we look forward to putting up maybe dashboards and, and templates and, and other components on GitHub as soon as we get those all uh, cleared from, from our lovely legal department. So uh, we have like, I think, no time for, maybe we have a minute or two for questions, but otherwise, uh, thank you very much. <laughs>